Hey guys, so I'm still over here in, in, in Indonesia um, before I head back to Singapore um, and I was just thinking about a few things and one of the things I was thinking about um, I'm just on my way here to the uh, small beach um, you know I was just doing shopping online it's, it's uh, Labor Day and one of the best times to shop uh, in America is on Labor Day and uh, that's when you have a lot of discounts 70 75 percent off uh, and so on and I saw this yeah, surprisingly I saw this ad for a uh, Brooks Brothers t-shirt now Brooks Brothers to me has always represented um, this sort of Seville low uh, institution in the UK um, that you know was sort of this the suit of very very affluent people um, and I don't know for some reason I rep you know I think it's from the UK it's maybe from the from the US from New York but regardless to when I see that when I saw that I thought to myself this is really interesting because when I think about that brand name I think about Malcolm X and he said something along the lines of you know it's uh it's back in the 1960s he said something about you know a a, a racist is a racist whether He's, whether he's dressed up in a hood of the KKK or a Brooks Brothers suit. And I'm paraphrasing, um, but it's a really good line. You know, Malcolm X was just um, incredible, uh, partly because he spent so much time, he spent some time in jail, never for, not for anything violent, um, just running numbers. And, um, which is really interesting because Bobby Douglas, one of the most famous, one of the best wrestlers, in America, um, who's also African, you know, African American, may have done the same thing, but you know, in a different way, which tells you how illicit activity throughout just American history has come to be part of the fabric because economic growth has been so uneven due to racial segregation. And it can't be a coincidence that you know these two slender Malcolm X was never when he was a kid was never that that big uh same thing with bobby douglas he was in a lower weight class <clears throat> and you got these two people that are connected somehow that probably don't even know they were connected in this way i think quincy jones was also doing something similar it tells you again how economic activity is so haphazard it's so random um and then i go online today in 2019 and i'm looking at this thing and i'm like this is really odd because First of all, I've got this t-shirt. It doesn't really align with the image of somebody in this very, very expensive suit. And you also start to, re to start to realize that the image is based on what you see. And that image, in order for it to be profitable, needs to be controlled somehow. If every time somebody wants to sell a Brooks Brothers suit, or now a t-shirt, um, at Nordstrom, um, if we're able to show you somebody who searches for Brooks Brothers an ad for the KKK or something that promotes racism enough times so that we associate that brand name not with class and Fabio Rowe and sort of, sort of these um, fancy institutions but if I can associate that with a Malcolm X quote every single time Maybe you're not going to want to buy that suit, or at least you're not going to want to pay a premium. Interestingly enough, that same strategy applies for international institutions and countries and the people within those countries by default. So if I'm able to denigrate Russian vodka, although that's probably a bad example, um, or let's say Iranian saffron. Um, or I'm even able to change the name from, of a food product from Palestinian falafel to Israeli falafel or couscous. And I'm then able to sell that. I can do that if I'm in charge of what you see when you search for a product or you see a product. And I'm, I'm able to take, rewrite history in a sense, um, if I'm able to appropriate something and then use it to advertise. Now that's something that we can all see is not a good result. First of all, because one of the reasons we want we want to have this private sector is to act as a check and balance against lies by the government, by the public sector. And so you can only imagine 
today, you know, being somebody that was born in Iran, when I see something, most of the things I see, uh, because I have a U.S. phone, a U.S. telecom carrier, although now it's bought out by the Japanese, which is a U.S. ally, I'm seeing mostly things that are portray the country I was born in in a, neg in a negative light, which of course devalues the products from that country, which then makes it easier to impose sanctions on that country, um, thereby devaluing its currency, thereby creating this sort of tiered structure um, among different nations, all of which was supposed to be resolved by diplomacy through the United Nations, which is now failing because you have so much advertising and so many different institutions that are deciding that, you know, they want to rewrite history. And they're able to do that because, in, in, in large part because, number one, it's easier to control the digital world than it is to control the physical world. It's very easy, in fact. If you look at the report um, that the United States came out with relating to the 2016 election, we're talking about, at one point in the report, the Mueller report, it talked about hundreds of thousands of dollars that were used to reach millions. So it didn't take a million dollars, it took like a few hundred thousand dollars um, to reach several million people. You can't do that if you have a book, a physical item, for many reasons. Um, number one, uh, you know, you have to read a book. You can't just look at it and like it. Uh, you can't just make a comment on it because the comment would make no sense unless you've actually read the page or the book. So what you see now is, is from this move into television, which Neil Postman talked about in his book, in many of his books, one of my favorite authors, and which the movie Network, very old movie and one of my favorites, talks about as well. You see this sort of moving away from intellectualism, um, which makes it easier to tell people whatever they want to hear. And that is actually what the digital world of advertising, is, it, it aims for that. It aims to show you what you want to see. And so creates a huge problem for many, many reasons. And I was thinking about this today. Um, you know, number one, for, for physical items, it's difficult to maintain them. You know, books go out of print. Same thing as with objects, they have to be replaced. I buy an Adidas t-shirt, it's gotta be replaced at some point. If it's digital, if I can create a, a world of just virtual reality, I buy it, I keep it forever, I only change it if it, if it goes out of style. And at some point, the style comes back in, in vogue. So all these things, are sort of, you know, designed to show you that we're entering a world that Neil Postman warned us about, that Aldous Huxley in Brave New World with his stoma warned us about. And the biggest issue now is that we have to be more skeptical about, about what we see, not just because of alleged interference in the 2016 election, but because it's actually, is, this phenomenon moves far beyond politics. It moves into every aspect of our lives. It's why I pay a premium for Adidas a German company, or um, a lot of other companies, or Nike. And what I've noticed as I've gotten older is, you know, I don't really care about as much about the brand name anymore. I care about where it was manufactured. So um, that's something that's actually more difficult to see online. They don't necessarily advertise the location that it was manufactured. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to figure out even where, you know, maybe the parts of something came from a different country and then now they're all assembled in a different place and it's just as made in X country when in fact all the parts were made in other places. So because of globalization, it's becoming more and more difficult to establish the origin of things. And that's all, you know, and, and that's all changing now perhaps because of uh, the goal now is to replace that defect through something called blockchain technology that allows anybody to sort of trace the source going as far back as possible. Um, and, you know, using multiple keys and multiple um, checks and balances within this block um, of data. So, well, the reason I, I'm thinking about all these things is because I've spent 40 years of my life sort of trying to figure out the world that I live in. And one of the reasons you want to have diversity, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm so sad that we're moving away from the globalization into a more simple sort of scenario, is because it is in fact people who are different, who are diverse, who are come from, who are outsiders, that do in fact tell you if you're wrong, whether it's the public sector or the private sector. So if, if I'm able to, you know, if I'm from Russia in the 1980s, I may, I'm actually able to tr translate something that is a press release um, by the leader of that country, perhaps better than somebody that's working for an official 
Here's why. Uh, number one, because I'm a native of that country, chances are the person who's working for the US-based or the Canadian-based or Newswire um, is not going to be as skilled as I am, as somebody who was born in the country as opposed to somebody that's picked up the language over time in a, in a school, even if that person has traveled at some point abroad. So the other issue, again, is that human beings are being devalued um, because over time, I'm just trying to, trying to figure out how to explain this, in an image-based society um, that the network warned us about, uh, that Neil Postman did the best job in, in English of warning us about, um, you don't need to think, you just have to click. You don't need to really, you know, your, your, your interpretation of an image is as good as anybody else's. Um, and so the world of digital, digital advertising that puts something in front of you based on your search history and based on what you look up online, um, a lot of that uh, is really going to be based not on accuracy um, and not on truth, but simply based on who has the most likes. So you can easily imagine a scenario uh, where a picture shows up of what well, today the, uh, the, the country um, that is sort of outside this, this tiered nation um, hierarchy, despite the UN, um, is Iran. So like right now, if you want to go online, wherever you are in America, because of that phenomenon, um, you click on something and chances are the article will, will be negative. Um, because, and it's not because it's necessarily the most accurate portrayal of the country um, or even of a city. Um, it's because enough people have liked it, that photo, um, and that's why it's the thing that you see. Um, same thing with a press release by anything from a leader of that country. Um, all that puts, is put together in a way that distorts what's actually happening because a, an image-based society lacks context. I take a photo here. I'm sure I can show you a lovely beach. In fact, here you go. Looks nice. But I can also show you that right across from me, there's plastic on the beach. Um, people are, are apparently not, take, not taking care of this place as well as they should. Um, you know, they've got, I probably can't see it, but there is plastic here. Um, I can show you at, at a certain point in time, uh, blue water, light blue water here, multicolored water, but then I can come also come here later on when the sun's not out and show you just brown and black water. So I, I say all these things because as I've grown up, because I've been an outsider, questioning things has always been second nature to me. And I've never trusted any institution. One of my law professors once said that, you know, I'm a populist with a small p. Um, in other words, I sort of believe in people-powered institutions, um, and I'm against the establishment, but I'm sort of looking for a way uh, to create a people, an, indi an individually driven institution um, that can help us all, you know, figure out what the world really should be and, and you know, how we can function in a world that is so laden with images um, versus, say, an image, a, a written, a, a text-based society where, like I said, if you want to comment on something, it makes no sense. And so if you have a situation where uh, a book is maligned multiple times, you still have to read the book in order to have an opinion about it. Um, and and if, if what you click on, let's say it's a book by former President Jimmy Carter, if, if what you click on, somebody with a lot of credibility, somebody, if you, you know, if you click on this um, review and somebody's made a comment that makes no sense, whether it's been automatically generated by an algorithm or even a human being that's biased, it's pretty obvious, right, that the you're not going to go back to that website or that publisher again because it makes no sense. So there has to be, you know, sort of a, um, a controller behind the machine that actually has some basis in logic. That's not to say that you can't manipulate the physical environment as well. You can put people there in, in front of you that are well-trained actors. Um, you know, there are a lot of poor people in the world a lot, and a lot of ambitious people in the world, and they're willing to do a lot of things to get noticed in an image-based society, in a video, which is now actually move into a video-based society. So the way, the, the advantage of this kind of a society um, is that you can tell stories better. Um, and a lot of these stories are indelible, they're unforgettable. Uh, if, you, if I think back to one of the best journalists in America, and I hate to say this because a lot of this is in the past, um, there aren't that many people that you consider acceptable that are being elevated um, in this image and video-based society today, even though they must exist somewhere. And so one of the 
you know, his, his tagline was good night and good luck. Um, Edward Murrow. And he was doing this interview with somebody and it was amazing because the government had, um, in his mind, uh, clearly targeted him uh, based on his beliefs and he was sort of stunned being an American in the 19, uh, quite some time ago, uh, that he was caught up in this dragnet that was targeting communists uh, with him, with sort of not the kind of targeting, targeting that made, that was really accurate. Um, and so it's an, it makes an, an, an indelible sort of impression upon you because it's not something that's it's fake. You can tell it's real. There's something within humanity's source code that knows when something is authentic and something is not. And what we're looking at now is as we move into an image-based society, into a video-based society, all of which is digital, all of which can be manipulated in any way, um, whether it's by deep fakes or whether it's by um, a highly coordinated um, system. It's something that we're losing as a species, which is why we're trying to, which is why it's so easy to give up our autonomy to machines. And the more, the more I think about this, the more sort of sad I get because it shouldn't be this way. Now that we have video, we should be able to interview people that are really interesting and everyone's got a story. Studs Terkel, T-E-R-K-E-L, did, did very, something very similar. Uh, and it was amazing to, to hear about the, the, these people's lives. It was also, as voyeuristic as what we see on social media today but again because you have to read it you have a better connection with it it takes some time and effort from you to get that book to open that physical book uh, and to peer into someone's life as opposed to what we have now uh, which is sort of a curated version that I think is easily forgettable because it's not as authentic as uh, you as as one uh, it's not authentic um, and I think that as I travel, that's what I sort of try to look more uh, for, but I think my, my the lesson I'm trying to impart here is that we're sort of focused on the political aspect after 2016, uh, and I've been focused on the political aspect too, just because I think that it represents um, a litmus test to see where, in what direction that country is going. Um, uh, certainly, I don't think it represents everybody in the, in the country uh, at all, especially when you have such close elections. And in, in America, I think only about 20% of the voting population came out um, to nominate in 2016 the people that eventually um, you know, sort of uh, let off against each other. Um, and so you see the sort of the same situation today now where um, one of the most able candidates, Tulsi Gabbard, was, didn't actually make the uh, next debate. Uh, so she's, not, she's going to be denied a public platform. Uh, despite having um, what appears to be the requirements, just not in exactly the same way that her party's national committee uh, has interpreted the uh, the rules. So, you know, that'll, you put all these things together and you try to figure out what direction are we going in and how do we make a U-turn to the extent that we're not going in the right direction. That's something I'm thinking about now. Um, I think that uh, partly you become an environmentalist, you know, the more you travel, just because you notice that the most beautiful things in the world, the things that, that are less able to be manipulated, are often physical and natural. And so they involve things like oceans, uh, forests, mountains, all these beautiful things that, um, that you sort of see can be, um, that can connect you to something that's authentic. Um, and whether that's as simple as seeing a tree grow, uh, from a sapling um, or just even a, a small cat, a stray dog that's just, you know, um, playing with other animals. So you, you sort of see in a farm time, in, in a farm like shepherd type setting, it, it again connects you to, you know, the same way uh, that you, that I thought today when I looked up this, you know, shopping online and I looked up this, this brand name, that connected me to something else. Um, when I think about these the dogs, you know, the shepherds, that connects me to a lot of other images as well. Um, and the idea, I think, is the goal should be to try to connect us with something that's true uh, and authentic. And it's becoming harder and harder to do that when all the, the digital media um, is sort of taking you in a different direction, as opposed to helping you figure out what's going on. So one example of that would be um, one reason I like wrestling so much, uh, and I'll be going to Kazakhstan, to Astana, uh, for example, let's say you, you go and you check out the uh, team from Azerbaijan and one of their best wrestlers I think is called Aliyev. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. Um, 
The other thing travel does is it gives you a lot of appreciation for people that speak multiple languages, um, just because you need those people to be able to understand what's going on around you. Uh, but you know, it turns out that Eliyev, Eliyev was actually one of, um, one of the most famous people in that country, uh, which explains why he has that name. Um, but it's, that person also has a very interesting history. Um, the person, you know, was, uh, and, and one of the problems again with only speaking a couple of languages is that you know that the, the goal has to be humility simply because we're not all that different. Our differences lie in superficial things like how we look, color, uh, and so on because we'll never be able to sort of connect fully because, you know, we're not going to have a universal language. Um, and if we do, uh, it'll be difficult to be completely fluent. Um, across the world. So there's always going to be a large portion of knowledge that you'll never have access to unless you speak fluently five or six languages. And if you speak English as, a, as your primary language, the very opening act of your life has to be humility because at most you have access to you know, 10%, maybe 15% of what's going on all over, all over the world in a fluent manner. So the goal, I think, the, the, the antidote to fake news and fake advertising and, and, and this society that is increasingly fake and not authentic is number one uh, a, a reconnection to nature uh, and it doesn't have to be a particular kind I don't actually, actually I don't actually like beaches uh, I like mountains you got to figure out what you like try to seek that out I think that'll make you happy um, happier um, and I think the other, the other antidote has to be humility where every time every time you see something you question it to the extent that it's it's trying to it's, it's trying to lead you down a path that is biased and that means you also you also have to make more of an effort in trying to find people who are authentic and trying to get their information from them while also realizing that the information they're receiving might also not be um, might also be staged um, in, in some way um, like I said even if it's just a situation where you know you see something at night it's 100% different from the same place in the daytime. I've been to places, and again, so it's not intentional if you create a, a situation where um, you're, you're showing something that's of your own opinion, um, but it's different. It's sort of like somebody who travels um, to a, a place with four seasons and only goes there during summertime, comes back and tells you this place is so humid, it's unbelievable. Uh, but of course, if you go to, to uh, Japan during, which is humid, uh, but only some of the time during, say, cherry blossom season, um, it'll be a different experience. So the idea is that you can't, you know, this idea, in, in, especially in, in English-speaking societies, of having one leader that will tell you how things are, especially one that's quite old, um, at least in most leadership positions, um, it's not the way to go. You have to have multiple people involved, which goes back to, to an appreciation of diversity, an appreciation of immigration, and an appreciation of how we can try to get people um, into a society, especially that first generation, where they can be a bridge from the past and from a different place. You know, we can be a bridge between not the present, the past, and the future in a new home. These are the things that I think about when I travel, partly because it is my own story. But it's also something that you should think about too, to the extent that you value things like democracy, because without that bridge, without more of them, you're just going to see things that are curated for you uh, and more and more inauthentic in a digital world that is now moving from, that has moved from TV to image, it's now moving into video. So you have to think about all the billions of dollars that are invested in brand names that are trying to get you to, to buy things, which is fine. I love shopping. Um, but you also have to try to be a little bit smarter about it because in a democracy, which typically elevates one person, you really want to look at, look at that person's team and you really want to create and focus on multiple people um, and also real, while also realizing that you know, you've got, in a democracy, right, it's the same thing as that image-based clicking system, um, where the more people click on something, the more it's presumed to be uh, correct, and therefore that's what's placed in front of your eyeballs. It's gotten to the point where I will be speaking to my friend about um, a car company, and within half an hour I get an email, spam, from that car company. And again, I haven't clicked on anything, and actually that's not true, I did, I did search for pictures, um, online 
Um, and so somehow the website picks, picked that up and now it's try, trying to advertise to me directly in my email. Um, this also happened to be where I don't click on anything. I just talk about something and the word um, generates an advertisement on my social media account or uh, an increase in spam. So we're living in a world where we have algorithms that are designed for numerical, designed to pick up numbers and clicks, none of which by now hopefully you figured out have anything to do with the truth. If anything, it might be the exact opposite because you have to maintain that image. And if we live in a world where something as hallowed, once hallowed as a Brooks Brothers suit is associated with racism and Malcolm X as opposed to a brand name um, on a uh, department store website, I, you can see how everything is connected in some way to an image that has to be maintained in order to maintain the value of that name, of that product, of the of that company, of that of the people within that company. In the same way that these images are manipulated uh, based on differences differences in countries uh, and the people within those countries and the employees within the corporations within the companies um, within those countries. And that's what John Lennon talked about when he talked about imagine a world with, I think, what was it? Just one nation, one people, you know, no war. All of what we're seeing today goes in the other way. It goes in, you know, especially when you have debt, uh, especially when you have differences all over with currency fluctuations and just, just different things that we're seeing now with China. Everything you see is designed to take you away from what John Lennon sung, you know, sang about. Um, sung about? Uh, maybe maybe I'm, not, I'm not. Maybe English isn't. I'm not even fluent in English. I think it's sung about. Um, back in the day. So I guess so. Um, with Yoko Ono, by the way. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, uh, I just hope you travel more and you're skeptical of everything you see and you seek out multiple sources. Um, and maybe you just try to focus more on um, on what you can figure out on your own and try to get as much information as you possibly can. Um, well, you know, because you realize that the education system, that the books you read, uh, that all the images you see, not just by you, but by almost everyone around you, especially by people people in, in authority, um, they're not necessarily true. Uh, and so what do we do? We have to probably get back to a physical, a world that values the physical more, especially a world that values um, things like places, um, you know, that people can sit down and meet each other and just talk. Uh, and try to get other people's opinions and that means that we need to we try to prioritize people that have uh, more personal knowledge of and, and who speak multiple languages um, and who are skeptical of what they see uh, and what they hear and hopefully we can get to that place and then the question is you know what do we do at that point um, because it does take about 40 years at least in my case to get to a point where you can kind of um, try, try to get a better sense of creating um, um, a sight system, you know, from your brain to your eyes, uh, that is less and less biased every day. That's all I can tell you, and uh, good luck. It's good afternoon, and good luck.